Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The fog rolled in thick and fast as I drove down the lonely stretch of highway. I was on my way home from the late shift at the factory exhausted and eager for sleep. As the mist swirled around my headlights, an uneasy feeling crept over me. Suddenly, a massive, dark shape darted across the road. I slammed on my brakes, my tires screeching on the wet asphalt. My heart pounding, I peered through the windshield, trying to make sense of what I had seen. There, at the edge of my headlights' reach, stood a creature like nothing I'd ever encountered. It was the size of a bear, with matted black fur and a canine face. But its eyes, those eyes glowed an unholy red, piercing through the fog. My blood ran cold as I realized I was face to face with the legendary Black Shuck, the hellhound of local lore. The beast's lips curled back, revealing razor-sharp fangs. Without warning, it charged. Panicking, I floored the accelerator. The hellhound gave chase, easily keeping pace even as my speedometer climbed past 60, 70, 80 miles per hour. Its otherworldly howl filled the air, a sound that seemed to come from the depths of hell itself. Mile after terrifying mile, the chase continued. My knuckles were white on the steering wheel, my eyes darting between the road ahead and the rearview mirror where those burning red eyes never wavered. Just when I thought all hope was lost, I spotted the old stone bridge up ahead. Remembering the legends, I made a desperate gamble. I swerved onto the bridge, tires squealing. As I crossed the water, I heard an ear-splitting yelp. Glancing back, I saw the hellhound skid to a stop at the bridge's edge. It paced back and forth, snarling in fury but wouldn't or couldn't cross. Breathing a shaky sigh of relief. I drove on. But even as the hellhound faded into the distance, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. Those gleaming red eyes haunt my dreams even now, years later, reminding me that some legends are closer to reality than myth. Throughout history, eerie tales of spectral canines known as hellhounds have surfaced their sightings straddling the realms of cryptozoology and the supernatural. From the misty moors of the British Isles where they bear names like Black Shuck and Modi Du, to the Appalachian Mountains of the United States, these phantom hounds have haunted desolate roads, graveyards, and ancient crypts. Often described as enormous black dogs with glowing eyes and menacing claws, these creatures are said to be harbingers of doom, their presence a sinister omen of death and disaster. Legends of these fearsome beasts vary, with some depicting them as loyal protectors, while others see them as the devil's own emissaries. In 1577, a monstrous black dog tore through the Holy Trinity Church in Blytheburg, leaving death and destruction in its wake, a tale immortalized in local lore. Similarly, modern sightings continue to chill the spine such as a 2014 archaeological discovery in Lyston Abbey that unearthed the massive bones of a dog linked to these ancient legends. Whether they are spirits, demons, or mere figments of the imagination, the mystery of the hellhounds endures, captivating those who dare to delve into their dark history. Across the globe, from the remote islands of Scotland to the forests of Michigan, reports of hellhounds persist. These enigmatic beings defy explanation, their spectral forms and terrifying howls a source of fear and fascination. As we explore these chilling encounters, we venture into a shadowy world where folklore meets reality and where the line between the known and the unknown blurs into darkness. Are hellhounds mere myths, or do they walk among us, unseen but ever-present, waiting to be discovered? The answer remains elusive, locked in the pages of history and the whispers of those who claim to have witnessed their terrifying presence. 
I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… When the criminal justice system falters, the dead may step in to rectify the errors of the living. Through eerie whispers, unsettling dreams, and ghostly apparitions, sometimes the deceased help to ensure justice is served. On June 9, 1979, approximately 35 riders boarded the Sydney Ghost Train ride in Australia's beloved harbor attraction Luna Park. Seven of them would not leave the train tunnel alive. On a fateful night in 1860 New York City, John Walton was gunned down in cold blood, setting off a desperate chase through the shadowy streets. As his cousin pursued the mysterious assailant, another life was claimed, plunging the city into a gripping tale of murder, intrigue, and a relentless quest for justice. The aftermath revealed a tangled web of family secrets, betrayal, and a courtroom drama that would captivate the entire nation. In the late 18th century, terror gripped the streets of London as a mysterious figure known as the London Monster targeted aristocratic women with cruel precision. Over 50 attacks within two years sparked widespread panic, leading to the formation of vigilante groups and a media frenzy that captivated the city's working class. What made him a monster, you may ask? He snuck up behind women and stabbed them in the buttocks. But first, eerie tales of spectral hellhounds have haunted humanity for centuries. From the misty moors of the British Isles to the dense forests of Appalachia, these colossal black dogs with glowing eyes are said to be harbingers of doom, leaving a trail of fear and mystery in their wake. Over the years, the line between folklore and reality has blurred after numerous individuals have reported their own true tales of coming face to face with these denizens of the underworld. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In the realm of the bizarre, an enduring type of being frequently cited is the existence of shadowy, ethereal, large canines, commonly known as hellhounds or occasionally demon dogs. Straddling the realms of cryptozoology and supernatural phenomena, sightings of these creatures have occurred across the globe, and now we shall explore several instances of individuals coming face to face with these enigmatic creatures. Throughout human history and various cultures around the world, tales of eerie hellhounds have been recounted, with the British Isles being a focal point for such chilling phenomena. Over the centuries, stories have persisted of phantom hounds haunting desolate roads, ancient crypts, graveyards, and untamed landscapes. Known by a multitude of names across the United Kingdom, these spectral beasts have been called the Girt Dog, Padfoot, Barguest, the Hairy Hound. The Yeth, Old Shock, Old Snarlyow, and Old Scarf, among a host of others. In Ireland, they are whispered as Puka. On the Isle of Man, they are known as Modi Du. In Wales, they are the Gwiliji. And in Scotland, they are feared as the Cusith. However, the most commonly used name for these enigmatic creatures in the United Kingdom is the Black Shuck, a moniker originating from Norfolk, Suffolk, and Cambridgeshire derived from the Old English term skuka, meaning demon, or perhaps from the word shucky, signifying shaggy or hairy. 
Legends depict these fearsome beings as anything from the phantoms of lost travelers to the loyal hounds awaiting their long-gone masters, enigmatic protectors of forbidden secrets, or even embodiments of the devil himself. With their presence stretching back through the ages, the folklore and sightings of these mysterious colossal hounds have inspired a wealth of literature and spine-chilling tales. An evocative excerpt from the old Norfolk vividly captures the dread provoked by their appearance. Quote, and a dreadful thing from the cliff did spring, and its wild bark thrilled round. His eyes had the glow of the fires below, t'was the form of the specter hound. In various regions of the British Isles, the appearance of the black hellhounds can differ based on local beliefs and customs. Typically, they're described as formidable creatures, resembling oversized hounds ranging in size from a large Great Dane to that of a cow or horse. These terrifying beasts are said to be entirely black, adorned with shaggy or tangled fur, and eyes as large as saucers glowing with malevolent hues of red, yellow, or green, though some accounts mention a single luminous eye. They are depicted with menacing claws, sharp fangs, and possess unnatural speed, agility, and strength. Reports of the hellhounds vary, with some sightings describing them as tangible and corporeal, while others perceive them as spectral entities that elude any physical contact. Legend warns of their blood-curdling howls that instill fear in those who listen, accompanied by a sinister, human-like laughter, yet their movements remain eerily silent. Particularly chilling are reports linking their presence to the fires and scorched earth, often signifying ill omens. In W. A. Dutt's 1901 work, Highways and Byways in East Anglia, he portrays the creatures as ominous beings capable of foreseeing or causing death, saying, quote, "...he appears as a massive black dog, haunting dim pathways and solitary field tracks, where his eerie howls chill the listener's soul, though his footfalls offer no sound." A fiery eye distinguishes him, singular and cyclops-like, at the center of his head. Encountering him forewarns of impending misfortune, with tales circulating that meeting him signals one's demise before year's end. It is advised to shield your eyes from his cries, close them even when unsure if it's the demonic dog or merely the wind's voice. If the Norfolk snarly owl remains unseen by you, doubts may linger about his existence prompting comparisons to the ancient Norse legend of Odin's black hound brought by the Viking settlers along the Norfolk shorelines." Unquote. Though commonly described in a certain way, these ghostly canines showcase a vast array of variations. Some tales depict them as being enveloped in mist or bound by chains. In other accounts, they are described as floating above the ground, lacking limbs, or even being headless. Additional stories tell of a peculiar hellhound in Balsham, Cambridgeshire, that resembled a large black dog with a bald, monkey-like head, walking upright and playfully darting in front of vehicles before swiftly evading impact or disappearing entirely. In Algakirk, Lincolnshire, during the early 20th century, sightings of a black dog with an unusually long neck and muzzle were reported. Some narratives suggest these spectral beings can take on different forms, such as horses or donkeys, with accounts of ghostly horses often accompanying sightings of mysterious black dogs. According to local lore, these malevolent creatures are believed to possess the ability to transform into human shape. Even more chilling reports include sightings of a black shuck at Krieg and Ordain, described with a contorted human face and devil-like horns, foretelling impending disaster and death with its ominous barks. In the realm of folklore, the notion that hellhounds had the premonition of death, disaster, and misfortune, or even possessed the ability to instigate such events, is a prevalent, recurring motif in numerous anecdotes related to Black Shuck. Throughout history, a robust tradition exists detailing accounts that depict these phantom hounds as ill omens or bearers of impending calamity. Legend has it that catching a glimpse of one of these spectral canines particularly locking eyes with it, foreboded an untimely demise within the year. Undeniably, Black Shuck was famed for apparently heralding death wherever its shadow fell. A haunting tale hails from 1909 
in the vicinity of Ardura Mall, Argyle and Butte, where a phantom black dog was renowned for signaling imminent deaths, such as evidenced by the experience of a certain Dr. McDonald, who encountered the dark hound shortly before his patient Murdoch Gillian McLean passed away. Frequently, black shuck is regarded as heralding a precise event. In the latter part of the 19th century, near Alveston, Warwickshire, a man named Charles Walton attested to encountering the same beastly black dog over several consecutive nights, until one fateful evening when the ghostly figure of a headless woman appeared in lieu of the expected hellhound. It later transpired that his sister had perished on that very night. Fast forward to 1930 in Buxton, Norfolk, where a man crossing a churchyard caught sight of a sizable black dog. Upon attempting to stroke the dog's head, which some may deem unwise, the creature is said to have vanished into thin air. Subsequently, the man discovered that his brother had met his demise precisely at the moment he had encountered the dog. The lore continues to grow, with accounts not solely confined to historical records. As recently as 2000, reports surfaced of a large black dog darting in front of two women journeying between North Allerton and Leeming Bar. The driver, in a state of panic, braked abruptly, anticipating a fatal collision. Yet the enigmatic creature purportedly passed through the vehicle, characterized as lacking facial features and sporting droopy ears. Upon reaching their destination, the women recounted their encounter to the first person they met, who tragically took his own life shortly after. Despite their malevolent reputation, the unearthly black hounds are not always viewed as evil or malicious. Many accounts exist of them fulfilling a more benevolent role, such as accompanying solitary women or others as they journey along dimly lit roads. In Cottingham, Northamptonshire, near the vicinity of Old Corby Road, these phantom dogs were regarded as companions, walking in a friendly manner alongside lone travelers and dutifully shielding them from danger or misfortune, vanishing promptly if approached or directly engaged. In another instance of seemingly altruistic behavior, during the 18th century in Collingbourne Kingston in Wiltshire, near Marlborough Road, a sizable black spectral hound was believed to have pursued two men who had recently been convicted of a heinous murder back to their village. Subsequently, the men were apprehended, and the enigmatic black dog disappeared without a trace. The black hellhounds were associated with various other roles as well, such as protecting churches or serving as gatekeepers of different portals like gates, doorways, or even the gates to the underworld or the entrance to hell itself. Additionally, black hellhounds are occasionally depicted as guardians of hidden locations or lost treasures, a legend especially prevalent in Scotland, such as the colossal black dog rumored to safeguard buried treasure beneath a standing stone near Mirthley in Perthshire. In Eastbourne, Sussex, in the Willingdon area, rumors swirled of three phantom black hellhounds haunting the countryside together, a sinister omen of impending misfortune. Meanwhile, in the Blandford Forum wooded area, a spectral procession known as the Phantom Hunt echoed through the shadows, with ghostly canine cries filling the eerie woodlands. These black shuck creatures are said to favor desolate roads, remote forests, and the somber crossroads and gallows where the spirits of the executed are said to dwell. Among them is a notorious black shuck that lurks at the gallows site of Tring, Hertfordshire, a massive phantom resembling a Newfoundland dog adorned with inky fur, fiery eyes, and jagged teeth. Legend has it that this hellhound embodies the restless spirit of a woman condemned for witchcraft in Tring in the year 1751. In ancient times, tales of gigantic spectral black dogs wandering the British countryside have been passed down through generations. As far back as 856 AD, a French manuscript detailed a chilling account of a colossal black hound that abruptly stormed into a church as if driven by an unknown purpose only to vanish without a trace. Subsequently, in 1127, the Petersburg Chronicle recounted a bone-chilling incident at the Peterborough Abbey. The Chronicle chillingly described the unsettling spectacle witnessed there, stating that following the arrival of Abbot Henry of Poitou on the Sunday when the exerge choir hymn was sung, 
numerous men reported witnessing a haunting procession of ebony-hued huntsmen. These huntsmen, mounted on black steeds and dark he-goats, led a pack of jet-black hounds with eyes as large as saucers, creating a horrifying sight. This eerie procession was observed in the deer park of Peterborough, as well as the surrounding woods stretching to Stamford. During the night, the monks were disturbed by the distant but distinct sounds of these bizarre huntsmen, echoing through the darkness. Vigilant witnesses who stood guard through the night estimated that there could have been as many as 20 to 30 of these figures, their haunting horns resounding through the Lenten season until the arrival of Easter, leaving a trail of fear and mystery in their wake. In a crescendo of unearthly events, the narrative leads us to the chilling saga of the phantom black hellhounds. It was on August 4, 1577, within the hallowed confines of Blytheburg's Holy Trinity Church that the congregation gathered, oblivious to the impending inferno outside. The tranquility was shattered by a deafening thunderclap, marking the arrival of a malevolent beast, a monstrous black hellhound with fur as dark as midnight, bearing teeth and claws bared in menace. It tore through the doors with a savage fury, unleashing chaos as it rampaged through the church. Lives were cruelly extinguished, innocent souls falling victim to its wrath. Witnesses recount its fiery aura, leaving scorched marks in its wake. The church itself quaked in terror, a steeple crashing to the ground in a cacophony of destruction. As swiftly as it came, the hellhound departed, leaving enduring marks on the church's door, sinister imprints known as the Devil's Fingerprints. The horror did not end there. Reports emerged of the same dread creature haunting a church in Bungay, Suffolk, a mere 12 miles away, claiming more lives in a frenzy of supernatural malice. Reverend Abraham Fleming chronicled the terror, recounting how the black dog or devil in disguise brought death with a swift and merciless hand, a chilling testament to the dark forces at play that fateful day. Bungay's coat of arms still proudly displays a black dog racing past a lightning bolt, keeping alive the area's folklore surrounding this chilling encounter. Reports of black dog sightings persisted in the vicinity long after the initial incident, with sightings as recent as 1973 when a man working near the church heard the panting of a large, invisible dog. In another eerie encounter during the 70s, a man walking by the church recounted a massive black dog the size of a horse charging at him from the shadows, only to vanish before impact. Such modern sightings sporadically surface across the United Kingdom. On April 19, 1972, Coast Guard Graham Grant, on night duty at Gorleston Rescue Headquarters, spotted a large black hound roaming the beach a quarter mile from his lookout, seemingly searching for someone. Grant observed the unusual creature for about two minutes before it mysteriously disappeared before his eyes. Unfamiliar with the legend of the black shuck, it was only after a colleague shared the old stories that the full peculiarity of the encounter dawned on him. Reports of encountering phantom black dogs persist to this day from various locations throughout the UK. At first glance, these tales may appear as local folklore and spooky stories, yet recent evidence suggests they may be partially rooted in truth. We'll look at that evidence when Weird Darkness returns. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars 
has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. In May 2014, an archaeology team from London, Dig Ventures, uncovered something peculiar buried 20 inches beneath the earth at Lyston Abbey in Suffolk. Located near where a terrifying hellhound was rumored to have slain worshippers in 1577 at Blytheburg and Bungay, the team found the remains of a massive dog standing seven feet tall on its hind legs and weighing around 200 pounds. Dating back to the 1100s, when Lyston Abbey was active, these bones, discovered alongside pottery fragments, may be linked to ancient accounts of ominous black hellhounds in the area. With a leg wound indicating intentional burial, the discovery of this colossal canine near the sites of legendary black shuck sightings opens intriguing possibilities. Brendan Wilkins, director of Dig Ventures, remarked, quote, the origins of Black Shuck must have a starting point, and perhaps it lies with the dog interred here." Unquote. In the ongoing debate about the strange, unearthed remains linked to the Black Shuck phenomenon, the true significance remains ambiguous. However, something intriguing is undeniably at play. Given the extensive history of sightings of ominous black hellhounds spanning the region, the mystery deepens. Is this solely a product of superstition? widespread hysteria, or mere hallucinations? Could these enigmatic beings be flesh-and-blood creatures, or does a more supernatural force lurk behind their existence? Are they spirits, demons, ghosts, or perhaps entities of an entirely different nature? The answer remains elusive. This puzzling case appears to embody a complex amalgamation of folklore, authentic encounters, urban myths, and the supernatural realm. It seems to straddle the outermost boundaries of cryptozoology, where the distinction between natural fauna and the uncanny blurs and fades into darkness. Whether these enigmatic beings qualify as cryptids is uncertain, just as it is premature to dismiss them as purely legendary or fully supernatural. The enigmatic Black Shuck of the United Kingdom occupies a distinct realm, navigating the shadowy territory amid myth, reality, and the world of otherworldly phenomena that perhaps lies beyond our current comprehension of the cosmos. In the realm of the supernatural, hellhounds are not merely a relic of British folklore. They roam beyond the confines of antiquity, with numerous modern sightings and encounters reported across the United States. Beginning our jury in the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern United States, stories of these eerie beasts have surfaced particularly in the states of Kentucky and West Virginia. Tales stretch back centuries with ominous accounts dating as far back as the late 17th century describing massive black dogs with piercing, glowing eyes haunting the land. These chilling narratives have persisted through the ages, carrying on into more recent times. Kentucky in particular has been a hotspot for such sightings, with reports detailing colossal black canines standing at four feet tall and spanning seven feet in length. Legend has it that one of these monstrous creatures prowled the grounds of Pike County during the tumultuous decades of the 1930s and 40s, reportedly leaving a trail of mutilated cattle and, horrifyingly, even humans in its wake, instilling fear in the hearts of the local populace. In the realm of today, such accounts piqued the curiosity of paranormal and cryptid researchers involved in the television program Mountain Monsters, who ventured to the region to conduct an inquiry. The expedition unfolded in a rather peculiar manner, 
though ultimately yielded no definitive conclusions. Conversations with local farmers revealed shredded livestock remains and chilling tales of a large, dark entity roaming the wild expanse. Further intrigue ensued when the investigators were presented with an alleged video capturing the creature, along with paw prints measuring 7.5 to 8 inches in length, unusually large for a canine. A bamboo drop cage was ingeniously fashioned during the investigation and laden with hog shoulders in hopes of baiting the elusive being out into the open. Though the creature managed to evade capture, the team could discern its presence by the ominous sounds of crashing foliage and guttural growls, accompanied by the sight of a looming shadow. The entire ordeal unfolded dramatically, leaving viewers to ponder the veracity of the episode. Despite the uncertainty, reports of hellhounds persist across Kentucky and other regions of Appalachia. In the Appalachian Mountains, stories abound of a massive black dog known as the Snarly Yow, boasting a gaping red mouth and sharp, twisted fangs. This creature allegedly roams the region near South Mountain, Maryland, earning nicknames like the Black Dog or Dog Fiend. Tales often center around a particular spot where the old national road intersects a stream and gorge. Rather than a physical entity, reports describe the Snarly Yow as more of a ghostly or spectral being, capable of shifting hues from black to white and altering its size at whim. Some accounts even suggest that bullets fired at it pass through harmlessly, while others claim it can pass through solid objects like walls or trees. The mischievous Snarly Yow has a rich history of causing chaos and confusion. Back in colonial times, tales were told of this creature striking fear into horses, causing them to throw their riders off in a panic before vanishing into thin air. This eerie behavior continued into modern times, with reports of the Snarly Yow suddenly darting in front of cars, leading drivers to swerve and crash in an attempt to avoid what appears to be a dog in their path. Upon exiting their vehicles, the startled drivers are met with the sight of the formidable creature growling and baring its fangs before vanishing once more. The Snarly Yow delights in chasing cars for amusement or startling hikers in the area by obstructing their path until they're compelled to find another way. While it may come across as a malevolent being, the Snarly Yow is not known to harm humans. On the East Coast, specifically in Connecticut, a testimony from the website Real Unexplained Mysteries recounts an experience in an apartment haunted by shadowy figures and the appearance of a massive spectral hound. One night this entity was first seen looming over the bed of the witness and her boyfriend. The witness described the chilling encounter in this way, saying, quote, I awoke to find it hovering over my then-boyfriend. He was extraordinarily large, standing tall like a human, with piercing red eyes and long, pointed nails. Its hands were unlike ours, but not quite like those of a paw. The creature had a unique snout, more pronounced than that of a canine. It was no ordinary dog, but a formidable beast. I mustered all my courage, though gripped by intense fear or perhaps having nothing to lose, and faced it like one would a dog. I silently commanded myself to show no fear, and the immense anger I felt is indescribable. It communicated not with words, but through a sort of mental connection, almost telepathic. I growled back in my mind, willing it to stay away. When the anger surged within me, it retreated and vanished into the wall. I wish I could say it ended well, but it did not. Night after night I was plagued by night terrors that always culminated in my untimely demise." Unquote. This account aligns well with the legend of hellhounds as ethereal beings rather than tangible ones, and it also corresponds with the widespread tales of them potentially feeding on fear. What the observer witnessed remains a mystery. Transitioning to Michigan, there are also accounts of oversized monstrous canines. One such report, shared in Jason Offit's blog, From the Shadows, originates from Romulus, Michigan. The individual, known as S. Costia, disclosed that while residing with their family on a farm surrounded by dense woods, they encountered something remarkably peculiar. According to Costia, there existed a dog-like creature resembling a Great Dane in size, sporting luminous red eyes that lurked in the darkness during the evenings. Costia described it as follows. Quote, 
we had this truly peculiar dog-like creature that lingered around the property. I refer to it as a dog-like creature because its sheer size and intelligence surpassed that of a stray dog. It possessed extraordinarily vivid red eyes. I'm not implying it was a werewolf or a dog-human hybrid, but it bore a striking resemblance to a werewolf. The creature often prowled along the forest's edge on our land during the day. It displayed no signs of fear. My uncle attempted to scare it off by yelling or tossing objects in its direction, yet it would defiantly rear up on its hind legs like a ram and charge towards him briefly. After the thunderstorms, we frequently discovered dead chickens or rabbits. We were aware it was the doing of that dog-like entity because it left large paw prints in the mud and claw marks on the windowsills. On occasion, we would find screens torn from our screen doors and windows. It never directly assaulted us, but it seemed to derive enjoyment from teasing and tormenting us." Unquote. In a truly unsettling twist, the eerie occurrences took a stranger turn when the mysterious entity showcased an unsettling ability to walk upright for brief moments and astonishingly began to vocalize, seemingly beckoning individuals outside with a hidden agenda. Costia recounted a disturbing incident involving his mother who stumbled upon him one evening conversing with the enigmatic being by the window. Recounting the surreal sight, she shared, quote, "...one summer night my mother left the bedroom window ajar to cool the room for me to rest. Passing by my room on her way to the bathroom, she overheard me engaged in conversation. Upon entering, she was greeted by the sight of me standing on my bed, soaked in my pajamas, conversing toward the open window." I displayed no signs of distress but was fixated, speaking softly towards the window. As she turned her gaze to the source, she was met by the unsettling sight of a dog with its front paws extended through the screen, peering in with a menacing growl, its eyes gleaming with a fiery red intensity. The haunting gaze of those eyes lingers in my memory. At times, I catch glimpses of them in the woods during the night, provoking occasional nightmares." Unquote. The boy's mother then hurled a beer bottle at the entity to drive it away. However, over the following weeks, Gostia purportedly exhibited peculiar behavior, causing the household pets to steer clear of him. He frequently uttered enigmatic phrases like, We don't want you here, our ghosts are nourishment, or God deems you wicked, and would occasionally deliberately pierce himself with sharp items until blood was drawn. It appeared as though the entity at the window had somehow infiltrated his mind, leading to what seemed like a form of demonic possession. The harrowing ordeal would finally conclude when his uncle used a rifle to strike it, prompting Costia to recount, quote, My uncle was outside fixing his truck when he spotted the dog near the woods, approaching the rabbit pen. Fed up with the situation, he retrieved his twenty-two from the house. As per his account, he took aim and wounded the dog in the hindquarters. The dog fled into the woods, never to be seen again, and everything resolved itself." Unquote. In Michigan, a peculiar account comes from the unexpected location of Detroit. In 2012, a resident living in one of the city's suburbs reported encountering a hellhound. Late one evening, as he drove through his neighborhood after leaving his girlfriend's house around midnight, he noticed a swift movement originating from a backyard. He described the being as a very large and robust creature. Intrigued, he halted his car to observe the creature, noting its remarkable speed, estimated to be around 40 to 50 miles per hour. After a brief observation, the creature vanished from sight. Describing it, he said, quote, The creature was sizable, akin to an adult lion in size. Its physique resembled that of a dog, albeit of an unprecedented size, with no wild or stray dogs known in the locality. Donned in a glossy black coat, I could discern its head outline from the side, but its eyes and mouth remained concealed from view. As it dashed past my headlights, it paid no heed to my presence, making no acknowledgement, slowing down, or showing any sign of interaction. I'm inclined to believe that if it indeed was a hellhound, it had no interest in me specifically, although I cannot be certain." Unquote. In the vicinity of Wisconsin, Reports have surfaced from a place known as Meridian Island, situated along the Chippewa River. According to eyewitness testimonies, the area appears to be frequented by a mysterious canine creature. One account involves a young couple, Shelley Touchstone and Chris Weiner, who found themselves at the island's boat landing in search of a secluded spot. Suddenly, a thick fog or mist materialized out of thin air, 
filling them with an unexplained sense of dread. They sensed movement and heard menacing growls just beyond their line of sight, accompanied by the presence of a massive shadow with two glowing red eyes resembling those of a bear. On a separate occasion, two men, Mike Bogosi and Jeremy Stark, experienced a similar unnerving atmosphere in the same location. They too were overcome by a feeling of impending doom as a fog inexplicably appeared. Their eyes fell upon a large black hound with tangled, dirty fur which began to pursue them as they fled. It seems they narrowly escaped by reaching their vehicle and locking themselves inside, causing the creature to eventually wander off into the wilderness and disappear. These incidents raise intriguing points as hellhounds are said to favor watery areas, and the recurring presence of a fog or mist in supernatural events adds to the enigma surrounding this phenomenon. Venturing south, a peculiar incident unfolds in the state of Louisiana, detailed in a publication by the National Cryptid Society. The account hails from Robeline, Louisiana in 1995 and revolves around a witness embarking on a search for paranormal occurrences within a graveyard. Armed with crosses and even an M16, a rather unconventional pairing, the duo proceeded into the cemetery. It's reported that as they advanced, eerie growls echoed around them, setting the scene for a chilling encounter. Describing the moment, the witness recalls, quote, "...our flashlights danced across the small fenced graveyard. Spotting a burial ground, my first assumption was of a tethered dog residing nearby. Just beyond, roughly 500 feet away, stood the church and the parsonage. Peering closer, four recent graves came into view, distinctly set apart from the others." Absent of adornments, these two larger and two smaller graves stood adorned with iron crosses. As we moved in for a closer look, the growls intensified, prompting my companion to inquire if a dog had broken loose. Initially feeling somewhat reassured by the fence's presence, an undeniable sense of dread began to envelop us as we approached the graves. The menacing growls, reminiscent of a formidable Rottweiler, permeated the air, evoking a palpable sense of unease. Drawing nearer, my apprehension peaked sending shivers down my spine, a sensation mirrored by my companion. The unearthly growls, detached from any discernible source, defied a rational explanation. Were they stray dogs or perhaps a pack of coyotes lurking beyond the gate? Illuminated by our flashlights, however, two pairs of glowing red eyes materialized, devoid of any physical form, standing mere feet away, positioned as sentinels by the graves. Gripped by fear, my companion looked to me, Relinquishing his firearm in a panic, Lanny, I urged, your weapon is of no use against this. The spectral canines exuded a malevolent aura, prompting me to implore my friend not to flee. Fervently invoking divine intervention, though distant from the church for many years, a deep-rooted recognition of the malevolent forces at play stirred within me. Meeting the sinister gaze head-on, brandishing my cross, I confronted the entities, asserting my knowledge of their nature. In response, their snarls grew fiercer while my companion, overwhelmed by terror, yearned for maternal comfort. Lanny, please, I beseeched, I command in the name of Jesus Christ that you permit our departure, for we come in peace and solitude. Asserting the authority of the Son of Man, the ultimate conqueror of evil, I declared our right to leave unharmed. Slowly retreating, we reached the gate and made our escape from that otherworldly encounter. Unquote. In this report, one can't help but wonder if things have gone a tad too far. Now, shifting our focus all the way to the opposite side of the country, in California. From American Canyon, California, a tale emerges from a 28-year-old named Jedediah. He recounts an eerie incident on his way back from the market one night. A chilling howl pierced the silence, drawing his attention to a remarkably large dog. Initially mistaking it for a stray or a pet, he soon realized its immense size made it more than ordinary. Upon closer inspection, he noticed its glowing red eyes and an appearance as if wrapped in barbed wire. His narrative continues, quote, Feeling increasingly uneasy, I pressed on homeward, dreading every turn, fearful of another encounter with this unearthly being. I was almost home when the beast reappeared, blocking my path. Paralyzed with fear, my hair stood on end as I shut my eyes, bracing for an attack. It growled a deep, menacing rumble that shook me to the core, threatening to buckle my legs. Despite the overwhelming dread, 
I instinctively began to pray fervently to the Lord Jesus Christ, pleading for the creature to depart. The growling intensified, a malevolent force trying to silence my prayers, yet I persisted, immersed in prayer, until the growls slowly faded away. Upon opening my eyes, all that remained were scorch marks where the dog once stood. To this day, I have not encountered that same creature or any like it. This ordeal leaves me pondering, what did I truly witness? A hellhound? A spectral entity? A demonic presence? The answer eludes me, and perhaps it's best to remain a mystery." Unquote. In California, there has been a mysterious case circulating involving what appeared to be a pack of ominous hellhounds wreaking havoc in Palm Springs. Back in 2013, there were multiple alleged sightings of these large black hounds causing chaos in the streets. Witnesses described them as having piercing, glowing eyes and razor-sharp fangs, with the bodies of dogs but the heads of wolves, leaving all who encountered them utterly perplexed. These creatures reportedly rampaged through people's yards and even attacked a man's car, tearing up his bumper before vanishing into the night. While there is scant evidence to support these claims, this remains a peculiar and intriguing tale. Meanwhile, nestled in the quaint mountain village of Velocruces, North Carolina, lies another chilling story involving a demon dog of sorts. The town gets its name, Latin for Valley of the Cross, from the intersection of two streams meeting at an almost perfect right angle in the valley. One of the town's most iconic landmarks is the ancient-looking St. John's Episcopal Church, constructed of stone and situated alongside Highway 194, adjacent to a creepy graveyard overrun by twisted trees and tangled weeds enveloping the weathered gravestones. Among the myriad ghostly legends surrounding this graveyard, the most outlandish whispers tell of a massive demon hound, as if emerging straight from the depths of hell, prowling the grounds. Since the 1800s, tales of this phantom have circulated, depicting the entity as a colossal, towering black dog with ominous glowing eyes of red or green, often shrouded in a veil of mist or smoke. The most famous contemporary encounter with this entity supposedly transpired when two young men were cruising along the highway past the ancient church. Suddenly a foreboding, oversized shadow leapt from the neighboring graveyard, landing directly in their path, prompting the startled driver to hit the brakes and pull to a stop. Initially mistaking it for an ordinary canine, the realization that this was no regular animal dawned on them as the creature raised its head, revealing eyes ablaze with an otherworldly light that cut through the darkness, exposing its immense size, towering as tall as a grown man. Peering through the dim light at the peculiar creature, they discerned its unkempt jet-black fur and menacing fangs, instilling enough fear to deter the men from venturing out of their vehicle. The mysterious creature reportedly locked eyes with them briefly before bounding down the road in their direction, jolting the driver out of his panicked trance, causing them to flee in utter terror. As recounted by the observer, the entity proceeded to pursue them relentlessly, effortlessly matching their speeds as they accelerated past 50, 60, and even 70 miles per hour, never fading into the distance. It was only when they raced across a bridge that spanned the river in the shape of a cross that the beast abruptly halted, refusing to proceed any further, pacing back and forth until disappearing from sight as the tale goes. This particular tale of the demon dog may be the most widely recognized, but it is far from the sole account. Reports of encountering this spectral hound have surfaced from various sources. One such story originates from a Reddit user who recounts a chilling experience during a skiing and snowboarding expedition in the mountainous region, accompanied by his close companion Stephen and Stephen's family. On a day out to dine at the renowned Daniel Boone Inn during their trip, as they journeyed back up to the ski resort with his uncle driving, their route led them past the famous St. John's Episcopal Church. Suddenly, the vehicle inexplicably came to a halt, leaving the occupants puzzled. Initially presumed to be a prank by the uncle, the atmosphere shifted when they observed a look of terror on his face. The witness vividly describes the eerie moment that followed. Quote, his gaze was fixed intently on the rear window, as if ensnared in a trance. Then I too beheld it. Looming behind the vehicle, just beyond the glow of the brake lights, was this anomaly. It possessed the features of a large black wolf, 
with a humanoid body structure, albeit with disproportionately elongated arms. Standing upright on robust legs, it defied all sense of logic, yet its unsettling presence held my friend in a grip of dread. My mother, though she remains reticent about the incident to this day, appeared to catch a glimpse of it. All I recall is her urgent pleas for my uncle to drive on. Moments later, the van lurched forward, setting off towards home. Throughout the journey, Stephen and I kept watch through the rear window. What we saw that night still sends shivers down my spine. The entity descended and began pursuing our vehicle on all fours in an unnatural manner. Its gait was so disturbingly uncanny that the memory haunts my dreams. It seemed to move ahead of time, its sleek and graceful motion drawing me into a surreal trance. Despite our speed of 60 miles per hour along the isolated highway, it stayed in relentless pursuit, its grotesque, wolf-like visage and nightmare made real. Those eyes resembling smoldering embers with unyielding yellow irises and circling abyssal black pupils were utterly mesmerizing. Perhaps overwhelmed by fear, the next morning found me waking up at the mountain house in a daze. Stephen to this day grapples with the memory under the veil of humor, his reluctance to confront it head-on betraying the profound impact it had on him. Yet deep down, I know that the recollection remains as vivid for him as it does for me." Unquote. Another account has an individual opting to remain unidentified recounting an eerie encounter while driving past a sinister church late one evening with her husband. Suddenly emerging from the darkness, a massive, wide shape blocked their path on the road, rapidly approaching as they hit the brakes. As they cautiously drew nearer, she described, quote, "...it appeared incredibly large and black, resembling a bear in its posture, but as it raised its head we caught sight of an eerie, reddish gleam in its eyes and a distinctive canine countenance." It bore a resemblance to a mastiff, albeit far larger, with a sturdy, muscular build and unkempt fur standing on end in all directions. Then without warning, it charged towards us at incredible speed. Before we could react, the creature was upon us, and just as we braced for impact, it vanished into thin air, leaving us speechless." Unquote. The demon hound of Velocrucis has entrenched itself as a prominent entity in the region intertwining with the fabric of local legends. Intriguingly, we're compelled to unravel the enigma that lies before us. Could it be a culmination of embellished accounts evolving into an urban myth, assuming a life of its own over time? Or does it belong to the realm of cryptic hellhounds from lore? An intriguing notion theorizes its connection to a church grim, a concept rooted in ancient traditions. In bygone eras, a superstition held that the first interred in a graveyard would be forever bound to safeguard it, leading to the internment of a majestic black hound as a perpetual sentinel in place of a human. Whether a figment of folklore or a bone-chilling campfire narrative, the prevalence of such hellhounds worldwide offers a tantalizing contemplation for those journeying past the ancient church and cemetery grounds. Hellhounds effortlessly straddle the boundary between reality and fantasy, leaving us uncertain about what exactly captures our gaze. What mysteries lie behind hellhounds? Are they sinister beings, ethereal apparitions, or something else entirely? Could they merely be ambiguous sightings of large canines or other wildlife? These perplexing accounts defy logic, hinting that ancient tales from diverse cultures have crossed over into the tangible world. Regardless of their true nature, sightings of hellhounds have emerged worldwide, including within the United States. Coming up, in the late 18th century, terror gripped the streets of London as a mysterious figure known as the London Monster targeted aristocratic women with cruel precision. Over 50 attacks within two years sparked widespread panic, leading to the formation of vigilante groups and a media frenzy that captivated the city's working class. What made him a monster, you may ask? I'm not talking about Jack the Ripper. This guy snuck up behind women and stabbed them, but did so in their buttocks. But first, on a fateful night in 1860 in New York City, John Walton was gunned down in cold blood setting off a desperate chase through the shadowy streets. 
As his cousin pursued the mysterious assailant, another life was claimed, plunging the city into a gripping tale of murder, intrigue, and a relentless quest for justice. The aftermath revealed a tangled web of family secrets, betrayal, and a courtroom drama that would captivate the entire nation. That story is up next, when Weird Darkness returns. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. As John Walton strolled home from his distillery on 18th Street in New York City at 11.30 p.m. on June 30, 1860, accompanied by his cousin Richard Paschal, little did they anticipate the harrowing events that would unfold. Passing through Third Avenue, a mysterious figure lurked in the shadows, catching their gaze but not their concern. In a sudden, chilling moment, the figure approached and fatally shot Walton, sending shockwaves through the quiet night. Chaos erupted as Pascal gave chase to the fleeing shooter, his cries of murder piercing the stillness. Joined by a group of brave men, including renowned railroad contractor John W. Matthews, the pursuit intensified. However, tragedy struck again as the shooter turned, taking Matthews' life with a single shot before vanishing into the darkness. Despite their valiant efforts, Matthew succumbed to his wounds, leaving behind a trail of questions and sorrow. Meanwhile, Walton, though alive, faced a grim fate as he was rushed to Bellevue Hospital, where he drew his last breath at 8.30 a.m. the following day. The night had brought tragedy and loss, marking a somber chapter in the bustling streets of 1860s New York City. Pascal firmly believed that John Walton's stepson, Charles Jeffords, was the shooter despite none of the witnesses being able to identify the culprit. A year earlier, Walton's wife passed away, leaving him with two daughters. Six months later, Walton married Ellen M. Russell, a widow with a complex past. She'd been married twice before and claimed both husbands had died. From her first marriage, she had two sons, Charles, 22, and Edwin Jeffords, 19, and from her second marriage, a son named Frank Russell, 12. She also mentioned adopting her sister's four-month-old daughter. Following the wedding, they all resided together on 23rd Street. Initially viewing Ellen as an attractive and honorable woman, Walton's perception of her shifted as he uncovered suspicious activities. Upon investigating, he discovered her murky marital history, including a marriage that ended in divorce with the spouse still alive and a doubtful legal separation from a third husband named Mr. Morrison. Furthermore, he learned that the alleged niece was actually Ellen's illegitimate child. The New York Atlas described Mrs. Walton as a woman driven by money, luxury, and intrigue, drawing parallels to Emma Cunningham, a notorious figure who three years prior was involved in the murder of Dr. Harvey Burdell. After the nuptials, Mrs. Walton's eldest son, Charles Jeffords, took a dark turn. Indulging in heavy drinking and bringing shady characters home, he vexed Walton, who admonished both mother and son. Yet instead of quelling the turmoil, this only stoked their ire. Charles even went so far as to issue menacing threats against Walton's life. With patience worn thin after enduring this for months, Walton made up his mind. The marriage had to end, leading to a decision to part ways. Securing a smaller residence on 23rd Street for Ellen and her children, he relocated to the room above the shop, leasing out to their grand house to another. 
This move provoked further outrage from Ellen and her sons, fearing the loss of Walton's fortune that would result from the separation. Charles and Edwin persisted in tormenting Walton, with Charles brazenly revealing a pistol he purportedly intended to use on him. Another unsettling incident occurred when Walton fell ill suddenly, suspecting foul play. Consequently, he revised his will, ensuring his daughters received the majority of his estate in a bid to thwart any attempts on his life for financial gain. The brutal double homicide sent shockwaves through the streets of New York. Prompted by the atrocity, the mayor extended a $500 reward for the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. Adding to this, Walton's estate offered a further $1,000 to the reward fund. Thus, a relentless pursuit for Charles Jeffords was set in motion by the authorities. Having sought refuge on Long Island, Jeffords, upon learning he was being hunted, opted to surrender to the police, maintaining his innocence when he turned himself in the following Monday after the tragedy. The coroner initiated an inquiry into the series of homicides. Among the numerous individuals who provided testimony were Richard Pascal, who positively identified the firearm discovered at the location as the weapon Charles Jeffords had wielded to intimidate Walton, and Ellen Walton, who affirmed that no hostility existed between her son and husband. Lasting for a fortnight, the inquiry failed to yield substantial evidence against Jeffords. Nevertheless, he was indicted for first-degree murder. The prosecution hesitated to proceed to trial due to the dearth of evidence. Despite an eight-month postponement, disregarding two regular sessions of the Court of Oyer and Terminer, Jeffords' legal counsel motioned, albeit unsuccessfully, for his client's liberation. Subsequently, the trial for John Walton's murder commenced on June 10, 1861, extending over approximately a month. Although the prevailing sentiment was that Jeffords was culpable, the scant proof against him resulted in no surprise when the jury acquitted him. Upon regaining freedom after six months, Jeffords grew overly self-assured. During an unexpected encounter in the 25th Street establishment with John Walton's sibling, William, Jeffords brazenly declared, "'Do you recognize me? I'm Charles Jeffords, the individual who took your brother's life, and I'm as capable of shooting you as I was of shooting him.'" William Walton inquired about the manner of the murder, reassuring Jeffords of his acquittal and immunity from further prosecution. Police detective Moore, who was present, verified that Jeffords could not be subjected to retrial. Jeffords disclosed that he had ventured out that night with the explicit intent of ending Walton's life, following a dispute between Walton and his mother during which she had entreated Jeffords to assassinate her spouse in exchange for $2,000. In informing Jeffords that he could not face a new trial for Walton's murder, they were indeed correct. However, Jeffords had overlooked the fact he was also accused of the murder of John Matthews. With the new admission, the district attorney had sufficient grounds to pursue this case in court. The trial regarding the death of John Matthews commenced on December 18, 1861. On this occasion, the testimonies of William Walton and Detective Moore proved compelling enough to sway the jury. Jeffords was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder and given a death sentence. According to the laws of that period, Jeffords was mandated to first serve a year in confinement prior to facing execution, with the final date to be determined by the governor. Throughout this period, his legal counsel made several unsuccessful attempts to challenge the verdict. Yet come May 1868, over six years later, Jeffords remained on death row at Sing Sing Prison. The narrative took a sinister turn on May 15, 1868, when Charles Jeffords was discovered lifeless in the prison's stable loft. His body exhibited five axe wounds, any one of which could have been fatal. Jeffords, feeling unwell the preceding day, had been excused from dinner and permitted to engage in light work at the stable. While absorbed in reading a book in the hayloft, he became the victim of a vicious attack. Subsequent investigations led to the indictment of two inmates, Thomas Burns and George Whittington for the murder. Burns and Jeffords harbored animosity due to an incident where Burns accused Jeffords of a criminal act and disclosed it to fellow inmates. A year later, Burns was acquitted and the charges against Whittington were dismissed. In February of 1869, the New York World spun a captivating tale recounting how a mysterious detective under the guise of Jefferson Jinx had engaged in conversation with Jeffords prior to his apprehension. In a moment of inebriation, Jeffords supposedly revealed a dark secret, confessing to the murder of Dr. Harvey Burdell three years prior, 
offering intricate details of the heinous act. The tragic demise of Dr. Burdell had sent shockwaves through New York, becoming one of the earliest sensational murder mysteries to capture the attention of the entire nation. The narrative crafted by the newspaper was eagerly disseminated, with newspapers across America either reprinting or providing synopses of the article. Yet the veracity of Jeffords' alleged admission, shrouded in doubt, would soon fade from memory. In the late 18th century, between 1788 and 1790, a mysterious figure prowled the streets of London, targeting unsuspecting aristocratic women with malicious intent. Referred to as the London Monster by the penny press of the Georgian era, this assailant carried out over 50 assaults in the span of just under two years. The emergence of the London Monster gripped society, prompting the formation of armed vigilante groups across the city and called for prominent figures like politicians, authors, and entertainers for the government to apprehend the perpetrator causing distress among London's elite women. The panic among the city's affluent ladies was unprecedented, not matched until Jack the Ripper's reign of terror in the 1880s. Meanwhile, the scandalous reports of the attacks, laden with suggestive undertones, captivated the working class and London's poor, avidly consuming the stories in the numerous broadsheet newspapers circulating throughout the capital. The London monster's unsettling method of assault was characterized by its unpredictability and cruelty, inflicting harm and humiliation on the victim in a public setting. According to the accounts of those targeted, a large man would covertly trail unsuspecting women in London's affluent neighborhoods, harassing them with obscenities before viciously stabbing them in the buttocks with a small dagger before vanishing into the night. In the bustling streets of London, the largest and most populous city in Europe, there roamed a band of loosely affiliated law enforcers known as the Bow Street Runners. Their moniker derived from their headquarters, situated on Bow Street. Despite being recognized today as the precursors to modern policing, these enforcers were rendered powerless in the face of the London monster's inexplicable and erratic assaults. Accounts of the London monster depict a dapper young man who would entice women with the fragrance of flowers, purportedly presented in admiration of their beauty, only to then seize them, place them across his knees, and administer a resounding spank. Conversely, other reports highlighted the London monster as a menacing figure equipped with sharp knives fastened to his knees, targeting the derrieres of London's elite ladies. Sarah Sophia Banks, the well-known and seemingly charming sister of the renowned scientist Joseph Banks spearheaded the initiative to raise awareness among London's female populace and the general public regarding the looming threat of the monster. Joseph Banks, a prominent botanist who had accompanied James Cook on his groundbreaking voyages in the 1770s, was affiliated with the esteemed Royal Geographic Society of Great Britain during the alleged presence of the monster in London in 1790. Through petitions, public addresses, and the distribution of newspapers, Sarah ensured that the plight of the monster's female victims remained at the forefront of both the media and the British society's consciousness. The young, aristocratic, and beautiful lady was known as Sarah Sophia Banks. The London newspapers vividly recounted the scene when Renwick Williams stood before Anne Porter to be recognized as the man who'd been haunting her in the park. Her reaction was immediate and dramatic and promptly fainted at the sight of him. Upon regaining consciousness, Anne passionately declared that Reinwick Williams was not only the perpetrator who had been shadowing her in the park, but also the one who had violently attacked her near her home, inflicting a serious wound upon her back in March of 1790. Blaming him for being the infamous London monster, her accusations captured the attention of the press. In response, massive crowds numbering in the thousands congregated daily around London's Old Bailey, clamoring for Reinwick Williams to face vigilante justice. During his trial for the alleged crimes as the London monster, Reinwick Williams managed to demonstrate his innocence, yet he did confess under oath to being acquainted with Anne Porter. He attested, under oath, that he had been captivated by her beauty since first seeing her outside her residence. Williams recounted an encounter back in March of 1790 when he had approached Miss Porter, only to be publicly rejected, leaving him feeling embarrassed and regretful for his audacity in pursuing a lady of her stature. 
while he himself was a wandering vagabond from Wales. Acknowledging that he had indeed followed Miss Porter at a distance on June 13, 1790 in St. James Park while she was accompanied by her fiancé, John Coleman, Williams defended his actions, claiming he harbored no ill intentions but merely sought to be near her. Williams' defense attorney successfully presented numerous alibis, proving his innocence as the London monster, discrediting the supposed attacks over the past two years. Some victims confessed under oath to fabricating their accusations for attention. Press members admittedly uncertain over the attack's validity, acknowledging their reliance on unreliable sources. Despite suspicions about Williams, it became evident he was not the notorious assailant preying on London's women and their derrieres. Doubt arose among spectators regarding the monster's existence. Ultimately, Williams faced three assault charges based on victims' testimonies, leading to a six-year sentence. Following his release in 1796, no further attacks attributed to the London monster were reported. Williams quietly pursued a post-prison life as a florist. In the wake of Reinwick Williams' trial in 1790, there persists skepticism regarding his identity as the infamous London monster. Many doubt the veracity of the testimonies and evidence presented, suggesting that Williams was unfairly targeted by a sensationalist media, a vengeful aristocratic woman beyond his reach, and an insecure fiancé keen on eliminating a perceived romantic rival. So the question lingers. Was the London monster a product of exaggerated reports, fueled by a press hungry for scandal and a society steeped in conservative values and wild speculation? Suspicion grows as the spate of attacks attributed to the monster abruptly ceases following William's arrest. As history fades into silence, the mystery endures. The safety of London's enchanting women remains intact, at least for now, until the looming threat of the London monster returns once more. Up next, when the criminal justice system falters, the dead may step in to rectify the errors of the living. Through eerie whispers, unsettling dreams, and ghostly apparitions, sometimes the deceased help to ensure justice is served. Those stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. The criminal justice system is like a complex puzzle. Identifying the perpetrator of a crime is just the beginning. Connecting them definitively to the crime scene is crucial. While this scrutiny can protect the innocent, it's maddening when it allows the guilty to escape justice. From bungled investigations to mishandled evidence and botched autopsies, the blunders of the living can stir unrest among the departed. 
They may even prompt the deceased to intervene and solve their own murders. Catherine Ballesteros was tragically found brutally murdered, stabbed 33 times. Traces of bloody footprints, missing items, and bloodied doorknobs painted a grim picture. Authorities hoped to match the blood to the killer, realizing they needed a criminal record to trace him. Surprisingly, it wasn't DNA that unraveled the case, but Catherine herself. Her spirit lingered in the morgue, anguished yet resolute. A whispered Baba to her mother, Emmer, unveiled a neighborhood figure known as Baba Notorious for Theft. The suspect, Ryan Baba Viscara, was captured. His fingerprints and blood tied him conclusively to the crime. Following a trial, he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. On February 21, 1977, a fierce fire challenged the Chicago Fire Department as it menaced an apartment building. Amid the charred remnants, the lifeless body of respiratory therapist Teresita Bassa, age 47, was found. A grim scene revealing stab wounds and a menacing butcher knife protruding from her chest. Despite the flame's attempt to hide the truth, the identity of her assailant remained shrouded in mystery for authorities. Meanwhile, at the residence of her former colleagues, Dr. Jose Chua and his wife Remy, Teresita's spirit lingered, conveying her tale through Remy. It was revealed that Alan Showery was the culprit, allegedly absconding with some of Teresita's jewelry. In a twist of fate, the stolen jewelry was uncovered in possession of Alan's girlfriend, leading to his incarceration. Whether through the spectral guidance of Remy or not, the unearthly testimony ultimately served justice by unveiling Teresita Bassa's murderer. In 1828, William Corder believed he had discovered the perfect scheme to evade justice after killing his girlfriend, Maria Martin. He opted to fabricate a letter to her family, asserting that she had eloped with him and all was fine. Initially, everyone accepted the explanation provided by the letter for Maria's absence. However, Maria's stepmother, Anne, began experiencing haunting dreams of Maria being murdered in the Crimson Barn. After persistent demands from Anne, her husband ventured out to investigate the barn. There, they discovered Maria buried in a grain bin, her body swathed in a sack with William's distinctive green handkerchief still fastened around her neck. William not only faced public hanging for his atrocious deed, but also underwent dissection and examination. Eventually, a surgeon tanned his skin and used it to bind a book detailing the account of the heinous murder. In 1826, Aussie farmer Frederick Fisher mysteriously disappeared. Suspicion fell on his dodgy neighbor, George Worrell, who conveniently remembered Fred signing his whole farm over to him before vanishing. After four months of ghostly silence, Fred's spectral form appeared to a man named John Farley, guiding him to a nearby creek before vanishing into thin air. Farley, understandably spooked, organized a search of the area. Lo and behold, Fred's lifeless body, bloodied and bruised, was uncovered in a shallow grave at the exact spot where his ghostly doppelganger had pointed. Before long, good old George cracked under the pressure, confessing to the murder and meeting his fate at the hangman's noose. Upon first inspection, it seemed that Nadine Hagg, a 33-year-old woman, had taken her own life in Sydney, Australia back in December 2009. Her lifeless body was found with a slit wrist in a shower, accompanied by a suicide note penned in her handwriting. However, Hag's family harbored doubts, suspecting that her abusive ex-boyfriend, Nestor Geisen, had orchestrated her death to look like a suicide. Hag and Geisen were entangled in a bitter custody dispute. The severity of the wrist wound, slicing near to the bone, appeared more severe than typical suicide attempts. Additionally, several pills were missing from the bottle, suggesting ingestion, yet no traces were found in her system. Initially overlooked by authorities, a hidden note behind the suicide letter was discovered reading, He did it. These haunting words were later uncovered etched in the bathroom tile three years later by subsequent occupants. In 2013, the coroner disputed the initial verdict of suicide by the police. Nonetheless, there was no concrete evidence placing Gizan at Haig's residence on the day of her tragic death. In a fascinating tale, a young boy from Gollan Heights, just three years old, 
astonishingly recalled his past life's tragic end, a fatal blow to the head by an axe. He guided elders to his remains, the weapon used in his heinous act, and even identified his killer. With unwavering determination, the boy bravely confronted the local man responsible for his former self's demise, causing the man to pale with guilt until, ultimately, the truth was revealed only after the bones and weapon were uncovered. Eerily, the axe injury on the skull of the exhumed remains perfectly aligned with a distinctive long red birthmark on the child's head. In a separate chilling incident, Amerjit Cohen, his wife, children, and mother-in-law were tragically murdered in 2003, their bodies callously disposed of in the ocean by the perpetrators in a bid to erase all evidence. However, their nefarious plan was foiled when a crucial oversight emerged. Cohen's body bore the address of his killers. Seizing an opportunity while imprisoned at Kenneth Reagan's residence, Cohen seized a piece of mail containing Reagan's address, concealing it within his sock. When his remains were eventually discovered, they served as a cryptic message, unraveling the entire chain of events leading straight to Reagan's home and implicating his partners in crime, Bill Hornsey and Peter Reese. Winter of 1897 saw the passing of Elva Zona Hester Shue in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. Her purported cause of death, as declared by an autopsy, was an inexplicable, everlasting faint. Unconvinced by this absurd diagnosis and the lackluster coroner's report, Zona's mother, Mary Jane Hester, received a supernatural visit from her daughter's ghost. Over a span of four days, Zona's spectral presence conveyed to her mother that her demise was no mere mishap, whatever an everlasting faint might entail. The miscreant behind her tragic end was revealed to be none other than her transient husband, Edward Stribling Trout Shoe. In a spine-chilling ghostly display akin to The Exorcist, Zona's apparition dramatically rotated her head to suggest foul play in the snapping of her neck. Following a belated autopsy, the startling truth emerged. Her neck had indeed been broken. Edward was subsequently convicted of Zona's murder and handed a life sentence. Yet, serving merely three years behind bars, he met his demise due to a mysterious ailment. In a bizarre twist of fate, the unfolding of unprecedented events took place. Simon Ning, a blogger, meticulously chronicled the chilling sequence of events leading to his own tragic demise and that of his sister, Sharon. It all began when his sister's ex-boyfriend, Jen Lin, made an unexpected visit to their apartment under the pretense of retrieving his fishing poles. Simon, in his blog post, narrated the peculiar occurrence of having his sister's former partner inside their home. Shortly after sharing his unsettling encounter online, Lin suddenly turned violent, viciously stabbing Simon in the chest. Subsequently, he proceeded to restrain Simon and pillage their residence. When Sharon arrived home to encounter the horrifying sight, Lin mercilessly attacked her as well before returning to harm her brother once more. Simon's haunting final blog entry on that day of the tragic incident hinted at the ominous turn of events that lay ahead. Thanks to Simon's blog, authorities were able to connect Lynn to the crime scene. Lynn was ultimately convicted in 2008 and handed a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. Ashley Howley was 20 years old when her former boyfriend, a malicious sociopath, took her life, encased her body in cement, and buried her close to his father's residence. Authorities had long suspected Robert P. McMichael II's involvement in her mysterious disappearance, but lacked evidence. Despite thorough searches by dogs in the area where she was hidden, they failed to pick up her trail, allowing him to evade justice for four years. Howley, however, sought justice relentlessly. She visited sleeping psychic medium Christy Robinette, revealing all the gruesome details, including the precise location of her remains. McMichael eventually confessed to the crime following the discovery of Howley's body, exposing that he had also taken the lives of his own mother and her partner. Up next on Weird Darkness, on June 9, 1979, 
approximately 35 riders boarded the Sydney Ghost Train ride in Australia's beloved harbour attraction, Luna Park. Seven of them would not leave the train tunnel alive. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door, late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Since 1935, the Ghost Train Ride has been a staple of Sydney's most famous amusement park. The train cars took riders through a labyrinthine dark tunnel where they were surprised by jump scares and other haunted house-style special effects. These effects caused confusion on the night of June 9th, when some at the park initially smelled smoke coming from the interior of the ride. Since the Ghost Train's usual attendant was not on duty, the smell was initially dismissed as part of the ride. But once black clouds began to billow from the entrances and exits around 10.15 p.m., it was clear that something was very wrong. Riders were evacuated from train cars as they emerged from the tunnel, and it was initially believed that all the riders had been saved. But some of the evacuees mentioned seeing empty cars as the train left the tunnel, and by 11.30 p.m., seven bodies had been found inside the remains of the ride. It's believed that those who died had left their train cars upon realizing the ride was on fire and became disoriented and trapped inside the tunnel. Six children and one adult died during the tragedy. Thirteen-year-olds Jonathan Billings, Richard Carroll, Michael Johnson, and Seamus Riley all perished. Their longtime friend Jason Holman was also on the ghost train. Holman has since described being pulled from his train car by an alarmed man before it entered the tunnel, when it wasn't yet clear that the ride was on fire. His friends had already entered the ride, and Holman remains horrified by the image of his friend's empty car exiting the burning ride on the other side of the tunnel. The Godson family was visiting Sydney on vacation when John Godson and his sons Craig, four, and Damien, six, decided to use their last few ride tickets on the ghost train. Jenny Godson, John's wife, and the boy's mother had described the split-second decision that left her the family's sole survivor. All of a sudden, I got this thought that I wanted an ice cream, she said. It was just the most bizarre thing. I asked the boys if they wanted an ice cream, and they said no, so off they went with their father. And that was that. I didn't meet them there. They were gone. By the time Jenny arrived at the ghost train to meet her family, the ride was engulfed. The bodies of John and his children were found soon after in the tunnel. The exact cause of the fire has never been determined and remains a source of controversy and pain for the survivors and bereaved. 
However, investigations conducted in the wake of the disaster did reveal that Luna Park had been cautioned the ride was a fire hazard. In 1977, the fire brigade had warned the park of the risks posed by the train's wooden tunnel, which was not equipped with emergency lighting and exit signs. The park had also ignored a warning to install a sprinkler system inside the ride. By 1979, when fire protective measures had still not been implemented, Luna Park was given 12 months more to make the changes. The fire occurred one month after this warning. A coronial investigation hypothesized that a cigarette or faulty wiring caused the fire and that the lack of lighting, signage, and the ride's confusing interior complicated evacuation. A fire inspector who had reviewed the train in 1977 said of the ride's interior, it was a maze, it was timber, all painted black. As a matter of fact, even with the light on, I was bumping into the partitions in the wall. It was a timber ceiling. I would have got lost even with the lights on. The only way I could keep going was to follow the railway track." In the conclusion to his investigation, Coroner Kevin Anderson stated that Luna Park had failed its duty of care to patrons, but not drastically enough to support a charge of criminal negligence. In 1987, a national crime authority also opened an investigation into the disaster. Although no new evidence was found, the authority did determine that previous investigations had been inadequate or ineffective. For those who lost loved ones in the ghost train fire, closure is complicated by the many questions still surrounding the disaster. For instance, some at the park that day alleged the tragedy resulted from arson. As recently as 2021, visitors and staff who were around the ghost train on the night of June 9, 1979, have described smelling kerosene and seeing a group of men standing around the ride prior to the disaster discussing using kerosene and matches to light a fire. One of these men allegedly said, you shouldn't have done that, just before the fire was identified. Many of these witnesses report feeling discouraged that they were not contacted by officials to share their first-person accounts of that night. Kathy Dewar, who was working at a Luna Park food stand at the time, says, For me, there were actually two tragedies. First, there was the fire itself. The second tragedy for me was the failed investigation, not having the truth come out. There was so much buried, so many facts distorted and hidden. I am definitely prepared at this point in my life to give a statement to the police and I really resent the fact that I was not given the opportunity to do that at the time. Anyone who was at the park that evening should have been interviewed by the police, and whatever observations they had, what experiences they had, should have been documented and recorded." Another theory revolves around Abraham Gilbert Saffron, a crime lord who some claim hired men to start the fire, then paid the lead detective in the investigation to cover up the true cause. Some say Saffron hoped to be able to use the Luna Park land for himself. In 2007, Saffron's niece claimed her uncle was behind the fire, but that he had not expected anyone to die in the blaze. However, she later denied making the statement. Saffron was also allegedly connected to several other fires that occurred following the ghost train disaster. Luna Park closed following the fire, and much of it was demolished. The site later reopened under a different name before resuming the Luna Park title. Today the park has new owners, and the Big Top concert venue stands where the ghost train once burned. The victims of the disaster are remembered through a plaque on one of the Big Top's walls. Memorials to the deceased can also be found in Art Barton Park and the chapel at Waverly College. The tragedy was revisited in a 2021 documentary series which investigated the potential involvement of Saffron and the witness accounts about the kerosene smell and group of suspicious men. Ultimately, the series called for a new investigation into the tragedy. On the 36th anniversary of the fire, Jenny Gonson said that she and Jason Holman, each of them the sole survivor of the groups they went to the park with that day, maintained a connection forged by grief, saying, "'We're very close. It's like there's some kind of web that joins us together. We sort of had survivor's guilt. We're here, and they're all not. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, 
stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 34 verse 19 – A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. And a final thought. God has uniquely designed your life, your talents, your skills, your everything specifically to have an impact on the world around you that no other soul on the planet can. You are that important. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.